Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and in this video I'd like to discuss the latest pressure on Rishi Sunak to do something about Gavin Williamson, whether Gavin Williamson resigns or Rishi Sunak sacks him. There's more revelations of uh, alleged bullying emerge. Not all of his cabinet colleagues seem to be keen on rallying around to defend him, often a little bit of a sign that a minister's position is not entirely secure. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So Rishi Sunak has been Prime Minister for what, three weeks? Three weeks today, is it? Already he's had to U-turn on COP27 attendance and two senior members of this government have been exposed as wholly unfit for their roles and he may well have to U-turn on a few economic policies as well. But in terms of the ministerial suitability, like Swella Braverman, seems set to survive for a while longer due to the trouble her supporters would cause were to, she to be sacked. She's in a totally different area to Gavin Williamson. Completely different situation. Williamson doesn't seem to represent a serious threat of rebellion if he were to be sacked. That being said, I still think Sunak finds him immensely useful which is not only why he made him a cabinet minister in the first place, but why the prime minister has not already sacked him. I think what Williamson brings to the table is a few things. One of them is information. It has been long said of him that he knows where the bodies are buried. This is an invaluable ally for a prime minister whose authority is very shaky. If Williamson has the ability to keep a significant number of potentially awkward backbenchers in line with what he knows, with threats of outing them for whatever goods he has on them, then that means fewer headaches for Sonak when he needs to get controversial measures passed by the House of Commons. Sonak was told that Gavin Williamson was under investigation for bullying allegations and he appointed him anyway. He'll even have seen the details of the evidence and still appointed him. Williamson doesn't lead a major faction in Parliament, so his inclusion can only be for the benefit to the Prime Minister. Gavin Williamson has a history of abject failure as a Cabinet Minister, but he has always been considered invaluable by former leaders for his ability to organise. Cameron, May, Johnson all felt that he was vital to their campaigns. He just made a right arse of running government departments. So Sunak has done the obvious thing, brought him into his top team so he can benefit from his organisational abilities, but he's stuck him in the cabinet office where he can't mess up any government department. Williamson gets the seniority of a seat at the top table without any responsibilities for which he is famously useless. And that's literally the case. When you look up cabinet ministers on the government website, what are their responsibilities? There's just a blank white bit for Gavin Williamson. No re formal responsibilities at all. But the pressure's mounting. Right? We saw Williamson's childish threat towards uh, Wendy Morton at the weekend. We discussed that in Saturday's stream. But more has been emerging since. You know, we're seeing claims of blackmail threats against MPs, much more sinister. Telling officials to, to slit their throat or jump out of a window. You know, there's suggestions here of bullying going way back, years. In an interview with Mel Stride, now this is a new appointment to the cabinet, and someone who had worked closely with Gavin Williamson in the past, I gather, he was asked if Williamson was a good bloke. He just asked the question, is he a good bloke? Now Stride did the usual politician thing of answering a completely different question by saying he had particular talents. I've no doubt he's got particular talents. Three Tory leaders in the past decade have, have prized those talents but it's not a reason to evade the question, especially as the answer could be considered subjective to a large degree. Whether someone can be considered good or not is, is, is largely subjective. So why would Stride have avoided the, answering the question unless one of two things is the case? First, Mel Stride thinks it harms his credibility with colleagues who will certainly know the truth of things if he defended Williamson too strongly. Is there a feeling in the parliamentary party that they're not minded to want Williamson being defended? Or second, is, is Stride worried that it will be possible to confirm some of the more serious allegations in the near future? 
You know, when you can't even get the full support of cabinet colleagues, then the pressure will only intensify because it will seem to those applying the pressure that there's a chance of getting what they want. Because normally what happens when a cabinet minister is under pressure, the prime minister will make it clear to the rest of those cabinet colleagues, you need to defend them. You know, you'll, you have to defend them, go out and publicly defend them. That's not happening at the moment. So the question is, however, who wants him gone and why? Now, in the Tory party, I mean, you can forget about any notion that Tory MPs are genuinely upset about a bully being in Cabinet, even if it's someone who bullied some of their own. They've got several in there who have form on that. They have stood by the most appalling behaviour from not just Boris Johnson, but other members of the Cabinet. A great many of them even stood by the indefensible behaviour of Dominic Cummings over Barnard Castle, and they didn't even like him. When it comes down to it, you can maybe understand a few MPs holding a personal grudge against Williamson for his behaviour towards them, whether reasonably or not, but not enough to produce this level of, of pressure and certainly not enough to gather that much media attention. So for others, it must come down to one of three things. First, that Tory MPs working against Williamson genuinely don't think he's up to the job of being part of a cabinet that will do well in the next election. Now, that's possible, but very unlikely. Williamson is not running a department, and his shitty character aside would probably be effective for the government working in the cabinet office. Besides, there are way more incompetent members of the cabinet to worry about. Second, that Tory MPs think that this will reflect badly on the party with respect their voters, Tory sleaze re-emerging and all that. They got rid of Johnson because the scandals were hurting the party's reputation. It is absolutely possible that Tory MPs, especially those who backed Sunak, just desperately want a scandal-free government to take them to the next election. Can we have a cabinet without the major baggage? Or third, that those applying most of the pressure are those who want Sunak to be weakened. Losing an important ally does that. Anyone with any strategic thinking will know that to take Sunak out, you have to take out his support before trying on him. You know, but the reality is, I don't know which is the reasoning behind the pressure on Williamson. What I do know is that pressure has grown since the weekend. And I mean from within the Tory parliamentary party. Wendy Morton, who, who made the complaint before Sonic became prime minister, but that was an internal party complaint. She has now submitted her complaint to the independent complaints and grievance system. Now, this is a parliamentary process. It's outside of the control of political parties directly. Basically, she's given the impression she doesn't trust her own party to take the complaint seriously. That's why she's going through an independent process. Number 10 now say they are looking into the allegations that Williamson may have told officials to do such things as slit their throat. Even if they're only doing it to make a show of an investigation, it does demonstrate just how serious this issue can be and that Sunak realises that this issue has the potential to cause problems for him later on. After all, Boris Johnson had a general strategy of doing and saying whatever seemed to be the easiest, laziest way to make a tricky issue go away for like a few hours. But often this meant adopting tactics that meant the issue only came back bigger and more serious months later. Sunak will have seen this firsthand. Surely he doesn't fancy falling into the same traps. So the question really is, just how desperately does Rishi Sunak feel he needs Williamson in his team? Because if he continues to stand by him, it's now clear he's going to pay a political price. Like I say, as far as can be told, this isn't like the issue with Braverman. Sunak is paying a political price for her inclusion in his cabinet, but it may be one that he feels forced to pay, that he has to. With Williamson, Sunak can choose to get rid of him without risking the fall of his government. So does he think the benefits of standing by him are worth the political price? He may not have that long to think about it, because even if Sunak gets rid of Williamson, in a few months, let's say it becomes inevitable and the pressure becomes so great, in a few months he has to get rid of him. If more allegations emerge or some particularly bad ones are proven beyond reasonable doubt, the damage could be permanent because the Prime Minister will have defended him for so long. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.